Shalom Chavri, my name is Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Very tense situation between NATO and Russia, and that tension seems to grow by the day as we see, see things that are unfolding. I've uh, been really surfing a lot through Russian media uh, just here this afternoon. Wanted to share with you some of the breaking stories coming out. This is on TV Z, uh, Zvizda. Dot ru. All these have been translated to English for you uh, via Google Translator, just so that you have a little bit better idea of what we have going on here. Uh, the first article here. This is from uh, a from the from Sh- uh, Sh- Shoigu, who is Russia's defense minister, who has spoken uh, about Russia's new developments. As an art, uh, things that have come out today in all kinds of Russian media. Of course, February twenty second, twenty seventeen. Uh, and on this particular article here, they are saying that how that Soigu is speaking about Russia is now protected from every single border with, a, with its new uh, r- missile attack radar system that they have put into place, uh, as well as all the defense capabilities that are being put around the country's borders in every direction, north, south, east, and west says around the perimeter of the territory of Russia, radar field created to protect against rocket attacks, Defense Minister Sergei Soigu said at the government hour in the state Duma today. He explained that the establishment of the new radar has allowed for the first time in the history of new Russia to establish the perimeter of the country's continuous radar field. Thus, the warning system missile attack operations on the strategic aerospace and directions for all types of flight trajectories or ballistic missiles they have now have all of that covered. I don't even know if the United States has that much sophistication. But then again, we're not sitting there with uh, Russian troops and uh, ships and everything else and tanks and stuff sitting on our border. Canada's not got all their tanks on our border. Russia doesn't have all their tanks piled up over there on Alaskan border. Well, maybe they do, I don't know. But uh, at this point, it's, it's a different situation. NATO uh, uh, and as well as the United States and the Obama administration have really built up a lot of uh, offensive capabilities. Not saying that it's going to be used for that, but they have built an, a major offensive capability on Russia's border to the west uh, inside of Europe. They're built up on the western border of Russia uh, to the south near Georgia. Uh, you have Romania. You have the situation all the way to the uh, far east of Russia's border there. Uh, the United States under the Obama administration moving into South Korea with missile, uh, a, a uh, defense missile system that can be used as a missile launching system that Russia claims that is that could strike all the way into Russia. In fact, Russia claims that it was not for North Korea and said it could not even work with North Korea. So there's a lot of um, distrust with the Russian government under the issues that were going on, on under the Obama administration. But now we have President Trump who is in. Let's go into a lot of other issues that are happening about this because I think it deserves some really close look at this. RIA.ru also. The delivery uh, system, the Bastion delivery system on the Black Sea Fleet is completed. Uh, they've moved in uh, the Bastion system. Uh, this is a Russian missile system that, that, that is used there no doubt to defend against any type of ships or aircraft that could come into the Black Sea. A lot of NATO exercises have been happening in the Black Sea, so it seems that Russia now has taken that extra precaution by delivering the Bastion system there. Uh, those of you that uh, know, this was the system that was used over in Syria. It really was the first time that it was given a test run in combat duty to see how it worked, and it did uh, perform very well. Uh, So it was used in Syria against uh, different targets there. It has a range of about 450 uh, kilometers over land and 350 kilometers over sea as far as how far this system can actually go. It is, uh, in essence, a cruise missile system that, uh, that the Russian government has developed there. Um, Sergei Soigo also uh, speaking about the Eichlanders. Now the Eichlander is the most dreaded uh, of ballistic missiles that Russia has deployed and those as well uh, are being deployed all over Russia and in different strategic points. Uh, Those of you that may know a little bit about this one here and this article here even includes that and this is on uh, TV's uh, 
Zvezda dot ru as well. This is the very system that was deployed in Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad, as you know, is on the north side of Poland, uh, and into the east side, it is uh, bordered by Latvia, Lithuania, and that makes it a very major concern for NATO forces here because these are nuclear uh, missile tips that, that are there on the Eichlander. Uh, we can see this in this article here on the national interest. Uh, it's called Introducing the Eichlander, the Russian Missile NATO Fears. Now, in its deployment of this, if you, if you buy this from another country, it has a much shorter range. But for the use for uh, Russia, they can actually shoot this missile at about 500 kilometers, according to the global security. That's what they believe the, the distance can be used for. It's not always armed with a nuclear warhead, but it is definitely has the capability to be armed with a nuclear warhead. And this is why NATO is really concerned about this being deployed to uh, Kaliningrad, the NATO's own Cuban crisis. Much of that is the same with John F. Kennedy when he was in office dealing with nuclear missiles being deployed to Cuba uh, off the coast of Florida. Now, Kaliningrad, NATO is faced with the same similar situation, and how are they going to respond to this? Because these missiles at 500 kilometers can easily reach Germany and even Paris, France. So it puts uh, all of uh, the European NATO allies in the crosshairs. And this is something that Russia has done. No, I, I have to be quite honest, friends. I don't think it was a provocative measure, although it's clearly become a provocative measure. The provocative measure is when NATO, uh, under the pressure of President Barack Obama, really begin to build up forces and put in the defense missile systems inside of the former Baltic states there. That's what broke the treaty that they had, and this is what has caused all the tensions to rise. And as all the equipment to continue has been building up by NATO, Russia has been acting also in response to that, as President Putin said they would do. do. So, uh, also there is a huge uh, amount, 12 billion rubles that have been spent on military equipment that is be, that is be delivered. Uh, and, and that is just, again, armored personnel carriers, uh, trucks, equipment, whatever you may, tanks, etc., uh, that Russia has ordered and that's already been paid for. And there's 39 different companies that are actually working on that. Um, now, keep in mind as well, Trump also, according, this is on February the 7th, this was reported here uh, by the Express.uk uh, there, that Trump uh, deploys tanks to Estonia as NATO builds up a huge army on the Russian border. Now, it wasn't that many more tanks and equipment that were being brought there or that many more soldiers, but you got to keep in mind, in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, all these little tiny countries, like little small states like the size of maybe New Jersey, they're bordering Russia uh, closer to what you might say St. Petersburg, especially, especially Estonia. Estonia is within about maybe 50 miles of St. Petersburg. And this is clearly a major force that has been building up. And President Trump as well has added even more troops to that. So what does Russia do? Well, Russia begins to carry out uh, according to the Russian Ministry of Defense, their website, Russia is carrying out exercises uh, with the Belarusians inside of Russia. Uh, they're doing joint training right now. Their airborne divisions are doing the joint training. And of course, that joint training exercises that are being done is in Peskov, in the Peskov region, which to kind of give you an idea is right there uh, just off from Estonia, the southern side of Estonia, and of course, the northern side of Latvia. Now, we had an inside intel a little while back. Uh, I don't think it's there anymore. I have no idea. I can't confirm it. But we'd gotten some information in from one of our, our viewers here uh, from Estonia that right here on the Navarra River, uh, in this region, right up here on the north side of Estonia, that there was more than 100 NATO tanks sitting in that area there. And they said that part of the Navarra River also happens to be a very shallow part of the Navarra River. And whether or not they would need pontoons to cross or whatever, it was still very concerning. It almost looked as if it was a, uh, uh, an offensive type of posture. Uh, now, again, that was last year, probably about seven, eight months ago that this was reported. But just as a reminder, I don't want to make any, anybody get all excited. It's not like something happening right now. But the next course of news is very concerning. The Czech people, no doubt, not very happy about this. According to Sputnik News, Czech loses sovereignty after pride of the Czech army comes under German command. That was something that was signed over by the uh, Czech uh, 
Um, the Czech ministry, Minister of Defense said the recent bilateral agreement between the Czech and German armies is subordination of the Czech military to, the Ger to Germany, which threatens Czech sovereignty. Vladimir uh, Vitova, head of the Czech Peace Forum, told Sputnik Czechska Republika at a meeting in Brussels last Wednesday, Czech Defense Minister Martin Stropanaki and German counterpart uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen signed a bilateral deal on a closure to defense closer defense cooperation, which put uh, the Czech Light Infantry uh, Fast Rapid Response Brigade underneath the German one. Well, it's starting to become more and more eerily like it was back during World War II, where uh, the German forces just slowly but surely overtook everything. But you know what's really interesting is Germany is really a, an occupied territory. United States is the conqueror, as was Russia when the country was split, but now that the country is no longer split, it's all under U.S. occupation still. So therefore, that's why Germany, you notice, kind of does whatever the U.S. says. Sad, very sad indeed. Uh, just kind of kind of closing out on our news broadcast today, I thought it was kind of interesting. Russia, following much into the lines of what uh, we see that actually got started with Hillary Clinton and now President Trump, starting to label certain news organization as fake news. And that does include, they have The Telegraph, I think they had NBC on here listed as one, and two others there. Uh, thus far, they're calling it fake articles that have come out against them. They put it on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of the Russian Federation, but they actually have a page that they're stamping as fake news. Uh, I guess in reality it is news that Russia has disagreed with as far as the content and, and these are on stories such as Russia considers uh, returning uh, Edward Snowden uh, to the United States. They claim that that was fake news, that this is never something that Russia has considered to do uh, along with a, a list of other type of fake news. And uh, as we all know, Hillary Clinton pretty much spearheaded the whole fake news ideology because of what happened to her in the elections and all the WikiLeaks that came out. Of course, it was blamed on Russia, that it was Russian propaganda that caused all of this. Uh, and then President Trump uh, spoke, speaking in Melbourne, Florida, just a couple of days ago there. He again really kind of hit hard on the fake news front there. Let me just share just a little clip of this here with you. Hopefully we have the volume turned up loud enough for you. We don't. Let me just kind of up that real quick there. Two things I want to share with you here. I'd share this little clip here with you from uh, President Trump. He's really, I'd have to say he's really on the side of alternative media in this case here because he is lamb blasting mainstream media. Listen to this. Dishonest media, which has published one false story after another with no sources, even though they pretend they have them, they make them up in many cases. They just don't want to report the truth and they've been calling us wrong now for two years. They don't get it, but they're starting to get it. I can tell you that. They've become a big part of the problem. They are part of the corrupt system. But despite all their lies, misrepresentations, and false stories, they could not defeat us in the primary. And they could not defeat us in the general election. And we will continue to expose them for what they are. And most importantly, we will continue to win, win, win. Definitely fake news has certainly become a major topic in, in a lot of uh, areas there. Both sides accusing each other and... Uh, uh, and, and quite frankly, we definitely seen that there was a propaganda agenda, and this was not coming from media sources either. The Peace Corps that went over different peace groups that went to Syria uh, during the Obama administration, they came back and reported that the propaganda coming out by Western media that had been orchestrated against that of President Bashar al-Assad uh, was overwhelming. Uh, we saw a lot of this type of information coming out from the Syrian conflict. And of course, we were watching as well the Ukrainian conflict and all the propaganda being portrayed in the Western media, kind of putting it as a twist that Russia was an, an aggressor and in invading Ukraine. And had Russia really been the aggressor and had Russia really been invading Ukraine, believe me, I wouldn't be taking up for Russia at all on the issue. 
but it was just the opposite. We saw the different reports that came out. We've seen the buildup. We saw, we saw back in July, the Ukraine government sent 40 tanks there to the contact line around uh, the Donetsk region, and mainstream media wouldn't touch it. Although BBC actually was following our news on this, and they refused to report it. They, they picked up our story about two weeks later when we reported that Russia was moving tanks into Donetsk, an extra load of, I think, another dozen tanks to the Donetsk People's Republic to help to, to help them against this huge buildup of tanks that was coming against them. But the BBC dropped our story because they saw where we were speaking about uh, what the Ukrainian gr group were doing. So we saw firsthandedly that in this case, BBC would not pick us up as a source on this story because they knew they would have to admit that Ukraine, or at least their, their viewers would find out that we had reported that Ukraine was the one that instigated the situation from the beginning. Now, ironically, it wasn't until this latest offensive that came uh, back at the beginning of February against the Donetsk People's Republic, the, the separatists there uh, that are fighting for their independence in the eastern part of Ukraine, that now Russia, Pre President Putin, has actually signed an order to recognize not so much their independence, but their passports, their licenses, etc., that are being done under the Donetsk People's Republic uh, uh, title there. But we saw in the articles there where Ukraine admitted having, what, 41 tanks on the contact line. We had estimated there were 40 that were brought up back in July. So we were only one tank off, and we did that based on the video footage that we had obtained that it came out of Ukraine on, on this issue here. So there is a lot of fake, and there's a lot of propaganda that is being brought out. And I have watched this, even with journalists that, we're, that we have uh, close contacts with on both sides. I actually follow journalists on both sides of the coin there. Uh, and, and in personal contact with journalists in both sides, both Russia and that of the Western media. And it's interesting as I watch, especially those of the Western media, I do see an agenda. They will not change no matter what the facts are. And that's concerning, that's concerning. Because for me, if the Western journalists have got it right, I'm gonna stand with them. In a case like what we just seen here, we reported to you here, on Israeli News Live this evening, we see Russia doing a major buildup. We see Russia arming with nuclear-capable uh, missiles around the region there, including, including Kaliningrad and even uh, down on the Baltic Sea uh, with their new Bastion missile sy system as well. A lot of things here, and could I say that it's provocative in Kaliningrad? Well, it's definitely not helping the situation with NATO, but what do you expect Russia to do? Russia is, again, tit for tat. NATO did start it, but I didn't think NATO expected that Russia was going to move in nuclear, uh, nuclear missiles either. And by the way, uh, the missile system that they moved in there, going back over that real quick, the, uh, the, um, we're, we're talking about the, uh, the Eichlander. Uh, this Eichlander, by the way, another reason why it is a feared missile by NATO is because this missile is very hard for them to detect. It, their missile defense system it ha would have a very difficult time detecting this. So it has become a major issue for NATO. And now when NATO is fearful of Russia because of what Russia has done in response to what NATO has already provoked, now NATO does have a reason to be, to be fearful. And I understand why they're fearful now, but they have to remember they escalated the situation, they're the ones that can also de-escalate the situation, and no doubt Putin would move these missiles from Kaliningrad back into Russia. Now, getting back though to the fake news though, let's go back again. This one was really interesting to me right here, um, on, on this right here, Sebastian Gorka, uh, who is Donald Trump's aide, destroys a BBC journalist is the title on here, Sebastian. He, he really though, he really hit the nail on the head, and, and I felt like we should just play this uh, here. Uh, and, and this is, regardless of what your thoughts are on President Trump uh, or not, I think he, the, his Sebastian here really brought out some very key points about mainstream journalism, because as we said, we saw the same scenario already with the BBC directly ourselves. Watch this here. I come into work every morning at seven o'clock, I open the newspapers, and I can tell you, that when I read a story that bears absolutely no resemblance to the issue I was involved in, I was in the room the day before when it was being settled, 
eight out of nine times it's fabricated and all of these anonymous sources. I'm sad to say that you and your colleagues have fallen into this trap of fake news. No, it's not fake news. We're trying to understand what is going on there. We're not making factual claims a lot of the time. We're asking questions that you don't like. Look, Michael no, Flynn... No, not at all. You I can ask away. Right, ask okay. away. Why is there this constant confusion in which the president sort of speaks, someone then has to go around with a bucket and a shovel, picking up the pieces, trying to clarify to the allies around the world as to what is going on? Your, your representation is just wishful thinking. If you didn't have an agenda-driven question list, it would be so much easier to have a better relationship with you. Come on, this, this is a media, mainstream media, that has accused us in the White House of being anti-Semitic and white supremacists. I mean, this, this is how bad it is. This is a White House where Jared Kushner, an Orthodox Jew, is key to the decision-making process, and you have the audacity as the mainstream media to talk about anti-Semitism. That's why you want to spin it, where, and we're not going to stand just, for it. Just tell me where the BBC, CNN, or the New York Times have, as a fact, said this is an anti-Semitic regime. Look at the response to the Holocaust Memorial Statement. I ask your viewers to Google it now. That's quite different to saying, quite Not different to saying, Not at all. Not at all. it's quite different to saying. And what's really ironic is, uh, Sebastian is correct on this. I, I was really kind of blown away by it when they were saying, uh, questioning whether or not the Trump administration was anti-Semitic when he is the most, uh, has stood with Israel uh, better than any president in recent history. Uh, other, all the way back until Nixon. Nixon was probably the second uh, president that really took a stand with, with Israel uh, greater than any other president. So truly, Donald Trump is definitely not anti-Semitic and far from it. And yes, they did pretty much try to claim he was anti-Semitic. So it's just really kind of uh, funny. And I just thought it was wonderful that this man here took and put them in their place. And what's interesting as well, the reporter there actually said, we're not always reporting on factual information. What kind of statement is that then? Uh, we're just asking you the questions that you don't like. You know, news is supposed to be based on factual information. The last that I understood it anyway. Oh gosh, what an interesting day today, guys. Uh, again, I wish I'd have thrown a, a bit of good news in here for, for the conclusion here. I'm trying to get more into that. Um, a lot of things are happening. Don't forget, and I know I've been saying this over and over and over uh, a lot here lately, and I apologize. I don't mean to be offensive about this, but those of you that would like to support this trip that we're doing, the meeting on March the 28th, that's next month in Israel, uh, there where we will be speaking with both uh, the, the Jewish community uh, and as well as those that are believers of Yeshua, whoever wants to come, doesn't matter what, what religion you're in, if you'd like to come and listen, uh, we do have a, an array of speakers that will be there and we invite you to come. Uh, do register, we'll have the website below where you can register, it is limited seating there, it's on Mount Zion, just outside of Zion's gate there, not far from the upper room there. We'll be meeting in an, an, well, another upper room kind of experience, so to speak there, uh, and we invite you to come, but we do, you do need to register, and if you'd like to support this work that we are doing, we do need your help in doing that because we are trying to cover the entire endeavor on this, so if you would, just please uh, contact us at IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can make a donation there, and again, we'll have that website as well as the website about the meeting in the description below. In this video, this video right here. I'm Stephen Medun, you're watching Israeli News Live.